Um, again, we get into Manifest Destiny, this, this first section of Chapter 7. So again, what we had done is you guys had read through in your textbook, um, and you were reading about this idea of westward expansion and the gradual expansion of the United States later on into the, you know, from the 1820s, 1830s, into the later part of the century. Okay, so that's what the reading was about. Again, Manifest Destiny was the idea that God wanted the United States to expand from sea to shining sea. Okay, that, that, that was God's wish. Okay, so there's a, a religious element to, to some degree or a divine element to some degree of that. Um, and really, when we start talking about Manifest Destiny and the expansion of the United States, <coughs> we really do have to talk about a little bit about Thomas Jefferson. Um, again, third president of the United States. And one of his biggest contributions to Manifest Destiny and this idea of westward expansion was um, completing or authorizing the Louisiana Purchase okay, in the early 1800s. That was the first kind of big land deal in the United States history. Again, Jefferson was kind of one of those guys that, again, his constitutional view was very strict. So if the Constitution didn't say that the president had power to do something, he was kind of apprehensive about doing it. But he decides that it was best for the United States to expand, right? There's a quote um, a quote in the beginning of the section about how he felt like this was what was meant to be, okay? So his completing of the authorizing of the Louisiana Purchase, that's kind of his big lasting contribution to this idea of the manifest destiny, okay? Again, manifest destiny is simply a term referring to the expansion of the U.S. from ocean to ocean. A couple things to be aware of here um, is that this was understanding that manifest destiny, quote-unquote, it was God's wish that this happened um, because the United States, we again, nationalism and such, we've thought very highly of ourselves, okay? And that God knew that we, quote unquote, again, not my words, but the, the idea behind this is that people of the United States would say that we were superior, okay? That our form of democracy, our way of life, our ingenuity, all of these different things were superior to other places. And that is why the United States should expand. So again, manifest destiny, that idea again too, that there is a divine portion to that, um, the name to be familiar with here is the guy who coins the phrase. You did a little, you read one of his excerpts the other day, last week in class, last week, Wednesday, actually. But the guy who coined the phrase, his name was John L. O'Sullivan. He was a journalist. Okay. So that's the time period we're on looking at the westward expansion of the United States. Um, and what we're going to see happen from 1820s and then going forward is we are going to see mass, mass migrations of people west. Okay. So reasons why the United States settlers choose to move west, and there's there's a lot of different reasons, um, juniors, but I would know that one of them um, one of them was economic or economic motivation, economic slash financial motivation. There was a lot of untapped land or unharvested land west of the Mississippi River. So again, there had also been reports that the farmland and say like the Pacific Northwest and such was very fertile. So again, there was a lot of land to be had there. So that was kind of like an economic or a financial motivation. We are also going to have groups of people um, that are going to travel west for religious reasons, whether they were Christian missionaries, again, who wanted to, who wanted to spread Christianity. Or we can talk about the Mormons, for example, and we'll get there. But those were a couple of the reasons. But I would know a lot of them were economic and financial. Um, eventually, we get to 1849, and California is becoming a U.S. state. And, well, what gets found in California? Well, gold. Okay, So we could also maybe say for this first bullet point, eventually gold becomes kind of a, a huge one, right? White European settlers tend to like that word. Okay, So those are the, the primary motivations. Um, you could also talk about American sense of adventure, maybe that people just like, you know, we're a curious group. Okay. We want to know more. Um, we like, we like adventure. At least some of us like adventure, maybe not all of us, but 
those are some of the big reasons or the the primary the primary reasons why settlers chose to move west. Again, at this point in time, 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, um, railroads and such did not really span that far west. So a lot of the travel was done via overland trails with like wagon trains or uh, covered wagons, you know, horseback on foot, maybe combination of those. So understand like, you know, it was, it was quite the trek. Okay. Whenever a person started going west of the Mississippi river, um, and going out to the Rocky mountains or the Pacific Northwest or the Spanish Southwest or however, those were, you know, those were big, big tasks. Okay. Things I'd be aware of here too, <coughs> is that as westward settlement, discuss the overall effects of westward settlement on Native Americans. Native Americans lost a lot of land. Um, reservational lands. Sorry, my spelling is off here. Reservational lands become smaller. All those things are big themes. Um, again, kind of the one reason why Native Americans eventually get placed on these reservations is because the United States wanted to keep them <coughs> away from white settlers. Um, there was a lot of rumors and such that Native Americans would senselessly attack settlers heading west. Yes, there, there is some truth to that, but it was not nearly to the extent as the United States government led people to believe. So as time goes on with westward expansion, I would know that the, um, the lands and the reservation lands belonging to Native Americans became much smaller. Okay, so one of these early, early treaties that dealt with reservational lands um, was the Treaty of Fort Laramie in 1851. And there's, there's a lot of Treaty of Fort Laramie's. I think there's two or three of them. But I would just know this was an agreement made between Midwestern and Western Native Okay, it was an agreement made between Midwestern and Western Native tribes to not attack um, westward white settlers. Um, the United States agreed to honor their land. So like originally this Native reservation, it was huge. It was like from the Rocky Mountains to the Canadian border. It was a big land. And what happens over the course of time is that becomes much smaller. And now we get to eventually get to the reservational lands that we have today that are, you know, relatively all pretty small in the grand scheme of things. But the United States promised to honor their agreement and to make oh, cash payments to the tribes. Reoccurring theme in U.S. history, juniors, do you think the United States actually honored this agreement? No. No. Hard, hard no. We did not make the cash payments. Reservational lands became much smaller, but... Again, an important uh, theme here in U.S. history. All right, so getting into some of our trails and such here. Um, I don't want to keep you guys a lot longer, so we're going to try to go quick. But early westward trails, the first one's the Santa Fe Trail. Um, I would know that this trail was primarily used by traders. Um, again, a lot of these overland trails started kind of in Missouri. Santa Fe Trail was one of them. Um, the Santa Fe Trail started in um, Independence, Missouri, um, and went to the Spanish Southwest. Again, at this point in time, the Southwestern United States was a part of the Spanish, you know, Spanish colony, I guess, eventually becomes a part of Mexico in 1821. But the Santa Fe Trail was one of our first overland trails. It was primarily a merchant trail or a trail used by traders who would then go to the Spanish Southwest to, you know, to trade goods. Okay. People who were traveling along the Santa Fe, Santa Fe Trail oftentimes did not stay in Spanish territory. Um, instead, they were going to, they were simply going to um, trade there. Okay. The next big one, again, is the Oregon Trail. The Oregon Trail, as Mr. Butler would correct me, again, I would know that this, similar to the Santa Fe Trail, this Overland Trail started in Independence, Missouri. 
and we'll just say in general it ended in the Oregon Territory. Okay, so think of where Oregon is on a map, or Oregon is on a map, and that's where they would go. Places like Astoria, um, Salem, Portland, places of that nature, some of these cities that you probably heard of today. Um, so again, you're talking, they're, they're walking halfway across the United States, crossing the Rocky Mountains. There's a lot of a lot of stuff that happens because of that. We hear about people like the Donner Party. Anybody know about the Donner Party and what they did to survive when they got trapped in the mountains? No? Donner Party. Not. Well, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I said I do not. Do not. Okay, Donner Party, what they end up doing is this big group of people, they get trapped in the Sierra Nevada mountains, kind of like in Northern California-ish, somewhere out in that region. And... They get trapped and they get trapped for months in a snowstorm. They end up resort to eating each other. So as people would die, they, they cannibalized. Um, so that's kind of one of the big, the big stories associated with the Oregon Trail. Um, again, from the 1830s into the 1840s and 50s, a lot of people, thousands of people are going to travel that trail. Um, primarily people who are going to Oregon, a lot of them had um, agricultural hopes. So the Willamette Valley is a fertile region fertile region in the pacific northwest when people traveled the oregon trail they were hoping to acquire land there because of the fertile soil okay um so again a lot of farming motivations also you talk about like religious motivations there's a lot of people traveled to oregon with the hope of spreading christianity in particular talk about the mormons so again this is a a unique, uh, a unique group or a certain group of religious individuals. I would know that their trail started in Nauvoo, Illinois. And it ended in the Salt Lake Valley, kind of out by present-day Utah. Which at this point in time was Spanish territory. But the Spanish let them in because the United States hated the Mormons. Um, big reason for why the Mormons move west. Um, religious reasons. Anybody know what were the Mormons practicing that was kind of unpopular with people? What was the issue? Why did some people? Uh... They like they claim there was like a third book of Christ, like of like 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 Jesus came to the United States after like the three days he was dead. Okay. Yep. So there's some of that too, where there is. The, the story that Joseph Smith found a found a book of Mormon, right? This this secret book in upstate New York where it was like the third book of God. Um, so there was that. There was also the fact that um, the Mormons at this time, a lot of them openly practiced what was called polygamy. Anybody know what polygamy is? Um, it's when you have more than one partner in a relationship. Yeah, it's multiple. In this case, it was multiple wives that a lot of the Mormons practiced that. And because that was frowned upon, um, they were, again, because of their, you know, their unique religious views, they were oftentimes kind of persecuted wherever they went. So the Mormons make their way really from, from uh, upstate you know, you, New York. Excuse me, words are hard right now. Um, from upstate New York, eventually to Illinois, um, where they lived amongst Native Americans. The Native Americans were relatively accepting of them until they weren't. And then there is a kind of this shootout brawl that develops in Illinois. And Joseph Smith, who was the founder of the religion, we'll say founder of the Church of Latter-day Saints, as it was called, is called. Again, understanding that refers to the Mormons. Um, Joseph Smith, who was the founder of the church, he's going to get killed in Nauvoo, Illinois. And from there, that's when the Mormons are going to make their way west. But again, primarily had to do with religious reasons. A lot of it kind of came back to um, polygamy and such, that they thought it was okay to have multiple wives. The guy who was going to lead um, the Mormons west, his name was Brigham Young. Okay, So you can say leader of Mormons after the death of joseph smith leads the mormons to leads the mormons to salt lake valley um again the mormons in the united states have a very interesting um history together 
There was almost a war fought between the United States and the Mormons. Um, again, Utah eventually becomes a part of the United States. It was Spanish territory for a long time, but the Mormons eventually develop. They become a pretty wealthy group of people because they develop some very unique irrigation systems. They also develop their own banks and some different things like that. And there was a lot of bad blood between them and the United States for, you know, a lot of them for those reasons and because they kind of did what they wanted in Utah. Eventually, Utah gets added as a U.S. territory. Brigham Young's going to be the territorial governor. Things eventually get better. But um, just a little background there. Brigham Young also has a university named after him, BYU, the BYU Cougars in Provo, Utah. Okay. So a little background here on some of our different trails. And then we get into Mr. Rowe's favorite president. And do not, do not twist my words here. I didn't, I do not agree with this guy's like, with his moral compass, James K. Polk, who's going to get elected by the United States presidential election, 1844. Um, by no means do I agree with his moral compass. He was a slave owner. He was kind of a jerk. But the one thing James K. Polk did as president that I would fight no other president, no other president has done yet. I got somebody trying to join here. There we go. Um, what no other president has done is that he did everything he said he was going to do during his campaign. So I would know James K. Polk elected as president in, I believe it was 1844. Um, he was a Democrat for those that are concerned about political standing. And his promise that he made while he was campaigning, he said he would serve one term. Guess how many terms he served? One. Also, to complete manifest destiny. He said that he would acquire the rest of what is now the contiguous United States. Meaning, there's some southwestern quadrant here. Texas, California, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Colorado. That entire like southwestern corner of what is now the United States belonged to Mexico. He promised to acquire that. And guess what? In four years... He did everything he promised he would do. Now, the way he went about doing some of those things was maybe, you know, there might be some question of ethics. Again, we kind of established that the guy was kind of a jerk. You know, he was a slave owner, etc. But I would fight anybody on this that he is, to this point in history, the only president who did everything they said they were going to do. And there's not even a debate about it. Okay, I mean, people talk about how you know, present day presidents, whether you're talking about Obama or Trump or whoever, well, they did those things. Well, there, there, there can be some debate on that. Okay. There, there really is with James K. Polk. There really isn't. He said that he was going to do two things. He was going to serve one term and complete manifest destiny. Those were his promises. He serves his one term in his one term. The United States acquires what is now the Southwestern United States. He serves one term promises kept. Okay. Again, I am not saying I agree with the moral compass or his ethics I am saying that he is honorable to some degree because he did what he promised he would do, which, as you guys know, politicians, not always that way. Okay, this slogan, 5440 or fight, this was Polk's slogan. Okay, and this involved the border between the United States and Britain. Okay, Polk wanted the United States to acquire all the land up to present-day Canada. That's not going to happen because Britain controlled that, but this was Polk's slogan slash, I don't know, I don't want to call it a promise, directed towards Britain. So eventually what happens here is a war is avoided. He said that this is the land the United States wanted. Eventually they agree on the 49th parallel. War is avoided. The United States and Britain are actually going to jointly occupy Oregon together for a period of time. Eventually that ends. Um, Canada or Britain kind of just goes, you know, they control everything above the 49th parallel in Canada. The United States gets everything below it. But a war is avoided. But Polk was all about it. Like, if you don't want to give us that land, we'll fight. His advisors later told him that, hey, that land, that all, you, all that land you want probably isn't very fertile. We don't need it. We want the land south. So that's kind of the story there. And we'll talk more about James K. Polk here in the coming sections. All right. 
Again, the only other thing you need to do is to write a summary about this, okay? Um, this video has been recorded and I'll share it with you guys on YouTube a little later on, okay? Anybody have questions? Questions, questions. Questions. Oh, Ugh. 